Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first day of Sheffield Dockfest. Um, welcome to the beautiful uh, Memorial Hall, uh, a wonderful shelter from the storm. And welcome to this masterclass with John Pilger. Over the course of pretty much the last six decades, John Pilger has produced over 50 documentaries covering stories all around the world, from the conflicts in Cambodia and Vietnam, five decades, sorry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> he's much younger than I imply. Um, Vietnam and Cambodia, um, genocide in East Timor, oppression in Burma, um, he was at the front line of exposing the scandal surrounding thalidomide in the UK. And over the course of the last decade and a half, he's been a very vocal critic of the war on terror. Um, he's written a number of books. He's contributed to so many newspapers, publications, and media outlets around the world. And one of the things that's always fascinated me about his work is the way that he explores the story behind the story. More often than not, this is uncovering the role of the media within a larger propagandist system. And at the same time, what's also fascinating about his work and something he's commented on no end of times is that the journalists should always hold up a mirror to themselves and the culture that they came from. This has resulted in a number of incredibly powerful documentaries about his home country, Australia. And this afternoon at the end of his masterclass, you can go to one of the cinemas to see his latest film, Utopia, which I not only think is a damning indictment, a powerful indictment of institutionalized racism in Australia, personally, I also think it's one of the best films that John has produced in his entire career. Now, this event it was, was put down as being an hour, but John and I spoke, and I, I thought it'd be a really great idea for you to see some examples of his work. So the event's going to be an hour and 20 minutes long. We're going to have about 20 minutes of clips uh, from his first film in 1970 about Vietnam to 2007's The War on Democracy. And then I'm going to welcome John on stage and we'll have about a half an hour discussion between us on stage and then I will open the floor to any qu uh, questions or comments that you may have. So without further ado, here is some examples of John's work. Please welcome John Pilger. Um, watching those clips the other day um, and seeing William Crystal and his reaction to your discussing how many conflicts there have been since the Second World War, and I thought, my God, you really can't get much worse than that. And then Dwayne Claridge appears on the scene. Um, yeah. it, it reminded me of a comment that you once said that it's funny, but it's not a joke. Yeah, they are funny. Uh, when I'm sitting in front of people like that, there's a sort of surreal moment. Um, there's also a moment of great pleasure when they disappear into the hole they've just dug. <laughs> uh, but they are weird, but they are very dangerous weird people. And uh, there are many of them. I thought the Claridge interview particularly um, was important because I've met a lot of CIA people over the years in informal circumstances and quite a few of them, not all of them, quite a few of them come across as Claridge, but you never see that face in public. It's that very tough, uh, ruthless um, representation of great power. And I thought that's what really, apart from its it's black amusement, that's what its, its importance was. It gave us a glimpse of really how power works. There's nothing complicated about it in the end. It is about the ruthless application, imposition of great power. I want to come back to, to the people who wield power, and, and, and you'll see a similar, well, two similar embarrassing examples in, in Utopia, if you're seeing that film a little later. Um, but I want to go back to um, your 1970 film, Vietnam, The Quiet Meeting, mm. it was the first documentary you've made. Mm -hmm. You'd achieved great acclaim as a journalist before that. And perhaps we can just talk a little bit about the beginning. 
what or who inspired you to become a journalist? Um, I think I, I knew so early on. Um, I mean, you know, you ask yourself this question, I was answer it was, well, it was because I, at a very young age, I used to sell newspapers. And, uh, but I used to get into trouble with the news agent that employed me by reading them. So I'd sit on the back of my newspaper cart and read them at a very young age. And newspapers had, I suppose, a romantic sense about them. They were also about the world. I, w I very much wanted to see the world at an early stage. And at the age of 12, I started a newspaper with, uh, at Sydney High School with uh, <clears throat> an old friend of mine who I saw the other day um, called The Messenger. His father bankrolled it, and we used to give it out at the school gates. And unfortunately, the name suggests something rather crusading and noble and worthy and everything. It, it wasn't anything of the kind, unfortunately, but it did get, it did acquire a certain reputation for getting, although the word wasn't known then, celebrities who wouldn't speak to the real press. So we'd run our scoops. And I suppose well, that whole notion of, of Brex, the front page, and, um, you know, I, I, I certainly, the idea of newspapers as an extension of really all human life was very much something that I felt um, very, very early on. I have to say, I only learned in Australia recently, there was down the end of my street in Bondi, there was a young man who would, had started work on a newspaper and uh, as he'd walk to work, he, would, he was a few years older than I, and he, he would inspire me with tales from the newspaper. Then I read that um, he'd actually been unmasked recently as spending his entire career working for military intelligence. <laughs> so <laughs> um, there, was, <laughs> there, was some, there was some tale there. But anyway, he started as a journalist, and I'm sure he meant well and before he meant he didn't mean well later on. <laughs> and you cut your teeth at the Australian Consolidated Press, which mm. um, I've, I've read that you talk about saying that it, it was sort of the real front line of learning how to communicate. Yes. I mean, I learned English, basically. English, how to write English on an extraordinary tabloid newspaper. I, then I went, came to this country to work on what was then an extraordinary tabloid newspaper. And I'm very sorry that the word tabloid is such a pejorative term now. Um, the paper I worked on, the Daily Telegraph in Sydney, its politics were, were terrible. They were uh, well to the right, but it had, um, it, it, it was run by uh, an editor who believed that, um, that adjectives and cliches and platitudes uh, and the passive voice had no place in journalism, that if it had to be direct speech, and that if you, if you wish to communicate, which is the whole idea of journalism, then you had to do it simply and without weighted words. So quite uh, separate from the editorial pages, the news pages were this, probably the straightest I've ever worked on. And I... You had to go to you had to go to a special uh, chief sub editor to get dispensation to use an adjective. Uh, you had to use in instead of during. Uh, it got a bit crazy because you couldn't say it rained. You had to say the rain fell <laughs> because that was the active voice. But that that gave me a sense of discipline which is really important with young journalists who tend perhaps to overwrite and think that they're perhaps writing their first book instead of a newspaper article. Um, that, that, that helped me. 
and got me started. And it's a very much, Orwellian so. star. And these days, when you talk about Orwell in relation to the media, people tend to say, oh, God, 1984. But things like Politics in the English Language, his brilliant mm -hmm. essay, it oh, just yeah. says cut through the bullshit yeah. and actually find out what's at the heart of the well, story. But that's what journalism is about. Definition, cutting through the bullshit. Or it should be. Yeah. It should be. You know, uh, so much of public life and public utterances and the media itself are what um, a character in uh, Larry David's uh, wonderful Curb Your Enthusiasm described as a, a babbling brook of bullshit. <laughs> um, and uh, journalism is there to, if not stop that brook, but to point to it and say, that's false or there is another story, or that's a distortion. That should be journalism's, you know, apart from informing the public about so much of the world, but, but really ben behind that should be, that should be journalism's main driver. And I mentioned um, in the introduction about the fact that you've written an awful lot about the press, um, broadcasting and how they're in, a, in many ways culpable or part of the mm. problem. Was that something gradual? I'm, I'm just curious, if you were based in Australia, then you came over to Europe, um, UK, covering a great deal of the stories in America. I, I'm just wondering at what point did it dawn on you or did it happen quickly that, that the media was essentially a major problem? I think with, I developed over a long period. I didn't come to journalism um, with my own mission statement at all. I developed and I became the creature of my experience. And I was very fortunate in that I was sent all over the world. I arrived here at the age of 22. And all through my 20s, I were the 60s. I was sent... Not the 40s, as I probably implied. In I don't. You, that's, that's, <laughs> you were card marked on that, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose all that... So, it, it, the things I saw shocked me. Uh, I didn't know about so much. I, I felt... I, I, I felt that it was a journalist's job to really tell the story from the ground up. And I'm quoting an old departed friend of mine, Martha Gellhorn, to tell the story from the ground up, not the top down. I mean, that certainly came together with my own anti-authoritarianism, <laughs> which came from uh, a political family. Um, but it, it was... I saw journalism as the voice of ordinary people, that there were so many other ways that those who wish to control ordinary people, political vested interests, the rest of them, uh, they had their own voice. And after a while, I came to realize that the media, much of the media, was part of that controlling force. So, you know, uh, I've always worked within the mainstream media, I work for a, a big television, make my films for a big commercial television company. I've, I've worked for Fleet Street newspapers. But this awareness uh, has always been there. So it's been a, a matter of trying to navigate through the system, but also call that, that media system itself to account. Um, that's terribly important, and it's more important now than ever that we live in this age of so-called um, saturation information. Um, in fact, we live in a media age. That's different from information. We get media all the time. We're now being digitalized, walk down any street and watch people being guided by the thing in their hand. Now that's fine, that's new technology. It's a means to something, but it's part of media. And there are very often very old fashioned ways of finding out what is going on because 
with this ubiquitous media, it's often very difficult mm. to find out at face value what really is the truth about various situations. There's a, a great line towards the end of his life. Um, Arthur C. Clarke said that of all the things that he predicted about the future, the one thing that he never predicted is that we'd have too much information. And it, 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 it's now kind of ironic considering the, the use of the word now. He said, rather than have blue skies, as I expected, we've now got too many clouds. Yeah, yeah. It's and it's almost, there's so much information now that it, it makes it even easier mm. for people to cover things up, mm. even though we're meant to be mm. in an age where we can find out everything that we want. Mm. Well, the language we use, the language we use with computers, which are amazing tools, wondrous, uh, is obfuscating a lot of it. I mean, it, it, every day holding on to the English language and its simplicity, which is its great power, uh, is, is quite a challenge. Um, and, uh, but, you know, there's much that, it is, that is positive about these technological advances. The internet is my main source of information. I used to look at a newspaper first in the morning. I still look at the Steve Bell cartoon first thing in the morning. Um, but I log on. Uh, now, it's something I couldn't imagine myself doing 20 years ago. Uh, so we do, if we know where to go, if we know where to find our way through this extraordinary technological maze, we can find out extraordinary things. We can find out what really is happening in particular situations. I don't think we can, through watching what is now ironically called the mainstream. I find most television news unwatchable, that I sit there having to monitor it or deconstruct it. Uh, newspaper front pages, pretty much the same thing. So we have to go to alternative sources. I, d I don't believe we have any, any choice here if we want to find out what our, our governments are doing. I mean, we've, we've seen this vividly demonstrated, and we've just passed the first anniversary of the Edward Snowden uh, uh, revelations. Uh, this is undoubtedly, this and, and the, the uh, whistleblowing of Chelsea Manning, Julian Assange, WikiLeaks, this has blown open the whole uh, idea that we live somehow in societies where information fro flows freely. It doesn't. Um, we live in societies that are uh, almost distinguished by their particular and uh, in invasive but insidious forms of propaganda, which many of us still don't recognize as propaganda. Now, now that we know the extent of surveillance, now that we know the extent of almost thought control, uh, then we should be waking up pretty fast um, about that. So, it, in, in some ways, this is, presents great dangers for us, but it also pr presents great opportunities for us to really find out, to discover, to understand, and to make sense of much of the world. Um, some, you were on a program in 2010, um, Democracy Now!, a US mm -hmm. TV program, and I was watching it earlier, and I was I, I, genuinely surprised. I didn't realize um, the presenter on that show said that there was a, uh, the US government had issued a notification to all people, uh, US ID, but it went down basically to all government employees saying, that they were not allowed to look at the WikiLeaks website, yeah. not just on their work computer, but on their home computer. That's and right. I found it very interesting that in 2010, the presenter of that program said, but how are they going to check on the home computer? Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly, a few years down the line, we know that they have been checking on the home computer. And linking that with, there was an article um, by John Lanchester in the London Review of Books a couple of uh, months mm. ago, and he was given access by The Guardian to the entire trove of the Edward Snowden releases. And, he just said the only thing that scares him is that there should be a bigger reaction 
than there actually is amongst the public. Hmm. It, it concerns hmm. me greatly that yeah. we don't seem that worried. I, th I, yes, I mean, people, particularly in the media, may often make grand statements about the public, um, that the public are apathetic, public don't seem to care, and, and are not moved by it. Well, there are many other forces at play in people's lives that they have to consider. And really, it is the, if that is true, it is the job of the journalist to interest the public, to make the public understand, if you like, to help the public make sense of what, of the, of the implications and the importance of, of, these, of these revelations. Uh, unless we make sense of them, they can just seem like um, a great tsunami of information that has been released. Um, and, um, and how they apply to our own lives, how, um, how the, the phone that you carry or your laptop is a window into your life. I mean, it's, you know, 25 years ago, if anybody had said, well, they're going to invent something that is going to replace the letter, it'll be very quick, uh, but everybody else will know what's inside the letter. You go, come on, it's ridiculous. Um, well, that's what's happened. Um, now, we can't all be looking at our phones and having attacks of paranoia about whether our various bill collectors or whatever are watching us. But there is a sense, there is an element of that. We do have to understand that <clears throat> uh, great power has reached into our lives in a way that it hasn't done ever before, hasn't been able to do ever before. <clears throat> Not necessarily to control them, but to monitor them. Uh, now, that's, that's something that ought to be a major political issue and I would suggest it's not that the public is ignoring it or not caring, but we have a political system that of course bypasses that and, and distracts us with uh, uh, a kind of uniformity of politics that leave us, many of us, in de despair about is there anybody to vote for anymore? So it, it hasn't been brought into the political arena to, uh, for, for most of us to understand. Staying with the idea of um, distraction and also um, you've talked in the past about Edward Herman and, and the idea of normalizing the unthinkable, mm. which is what institutions do so that we're not shocked by it. Thinking about your move from print media into becoming a filmmaker and what you said Martha Gellhorn um, said about telling the story from the bottom up, mm. was that the reason why you chose, as well as to remain a print journalist, to become a documentary filmmaker with the sense that you could reach out, that you could tell the personal stories of people's lives within the grander narrative of, 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 of a large story? Yes, I mean, I kept, I kept the, I've always kept the parallel career. I was very fortunate. I was able to, I started a television career with World in Action for Granada Television. And at the same time, I was working for a major newspaper, The Mirror. So I was doing both at the same time. Um, and it did strike me early on how they complemented each other. Um, and um, I mean, I was asked by a group of renegade BBC people uh, who had left the BBC believing that there was another way of making documentaries uh, and I was asked whether I would join them in this, this venture of, of uh, producing documentaries that would not follow what was known then as the BBC model, but they would 
look behind the screen, they'd lift rocks, they would be different in that they would be unrelenting in their investigation. Um, and I realized very quickly that the journalism I had been doing was very much film journalism. It was, it was documentary journalism. It was, it was investigation, but also illustrating that with human, a human microcosm of, of, of a situation. It was, it was the image as well as the, it was the form as well as the content. And I suppose I didn't, I thought the two actually complemented each other and went well together. What I found extraordinary, and especially with my first film, was that the, the impact of television, of the visual, was so much greater. And now these are the days before all uh, the multiple ch channels and everything that we have today. So television mattered a great deal more. And that first film, The Quiet Mutiny, had such an impact. You know, I was in trouble immediately um, with the uh, um, US ambassador and the chairman of the Independent Television Authority and uh, um, even parts of Granada Television and, and so on, because people reacted to that film uh, in such a way that um, it, it, it told me that this was something that could be used very powerfully, but had to be used carefully. And of course, the biggest reaction I had was when I made the first Cambodia film, Year Zero. That had an enormous reaction. Um, and it, 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 I suppose it, it taught me that, that, that the media, television, particularly, can be used to get straight through to people, can be used to um, do in many ways the, the, the job that social media does today. That it, I mean, I think one of the reasons that people embrace that is that it goes past the gatekeepers. Well, once television is allowed to do that, and even print media is allowed to do that, and it connects with people, that has a, uh, can have a, an extraordinary reaction, not always a positive reaction, can have a negative reaction, but it'll have a reaction. Before I take some uh, questions or comments, I'm a little curious about the two roles that you have and the freedoms you have within those roles. Do you feel that as a filmmaker, hmm. you, you've, over the years you've had more freedom or has it just been depending on who you're working for? and the times that you're working in? I've had to fight for every bit of it. Every bit. And yet, since 1970... I'm good at it. <laughs> it must be because there aren't many of your documentaries where I don't, at one point, just think, how the hell did you get this made? Good question. <laughs> well, there's a story that's written. Um, Anthony Hayward wrote a... Uh, a filmography about my work in which he, it's basically, it's very good, it's a, it's a, a catalog of all my battles with various uh, authorities. They kept changing from television authority to independent broadcasting authority over going to Ireland, over um, whether this was a personal view or not and whether it needed a, a kind of health warning, a disclaimer on it, and uh, whether, and so on and so forth. Um, it's been a battle, but, but it's been a battle that was allowed to be waged. That has been the difference in Britain from other countries that I know, the United States and Australia. Here, you could wage that battle. You'd sometimes lose and often win uh, to get certain programs on the air. People would listen. Um, and um, I suppose that, that it, it, it also, one of the things that 
helped kept me going, of course, was that there was the constituency. Uh, the documentaries were watched by large numbers of people. Uh, even those that now go out uh, an hour and a half long at 10.30 at night on ITV will be watched by two million people. Uh, and that's always been the case. I, I, I saw a, um, a, a survey not all that long ago, I think it was done by Media Lab, in which they asked people what they wanted more of on television. And it had all the menu of what you can get on television. They said documentaries. Documentaries. I think, I think generally speaking, people will trust documentaries or at least see them, see in it a form that helps them make up their own minds and helps them make sense of things. I don't think the news is trusted anymore. But documentaries are. Not all documentaries, and documentaries themselves have descended into, into uh, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, reality, so-called reality stuff that is a form of documentary, but it's not a documentary that makes sense of anything. It's a voyeuristic exercise and can be extremely well done. But film essays, which is what a documentary is, I think are very much welcomed and embraced by the public. That's been my experience. I should say at this moment that this summer, John, uh, late summer John will be following in the footsteps of George Galloway and appearing in Celebrity Big Brother <laughs> as uh, their, their media guest. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got some roving mics because we're filming. It's a gentleman down the front. Um, there was a phrase mentioned about telling stories from the ground up so many stories to tell, how do you choose which stories? Well, I have, I have interests, you know. Um, I, I, I suppose in the beginning, um, I would, the, the story that I would be telling was where I, where I was, what, what, what had, where I felt that something, I suppose my in answer to your question, I suppose the measure I've always applied is that is this situation being told or is it being distorted or is there something behind it that needs to be told? I, I've always regarded that as a, a, a basic way of measuring how I select uh, stories. Ian mentioned uh, stories I did on the thalidomide campaign. That took about four years in, in the mirror. Now, the main thalidomide campaign had been run by the Sunday Times. And I read the early revelations of how a lot of these children were getting, and their parents were getting, no compensation from the company that manufactured this drug that caused malformed children and stillbirths and so on. Um, but after a while, I realized that there was a class element to this, that those who could, those families who could stand up and campaign for justice for their children were usually, not always, but usually middle class families. So what happened to working class families? And I went to find out, and I found that there were two lists. Um, there was uh, an X list and a Y list. There was a middle class list and a working class list. And working class kids didn't get compensated. They didn't because their parents, their mother had usually taken from a doctor a sample instead of they, a prescription so they didn't have the evidence. So I suppose that got me going on what was a long story. And that probably applies to a lot of the stories I've done is what's missing here? We, someone had their hand up there, yeah. We're seeing it now, actually, what you were just saying about the, the, the focus and who becomes the focus for story. Both the cases, the, the missing children in Nigeria and also the terrible um, cases of rape in India. Yeah. And there seems to be an interesting 
I don't know what it is, an, uh, perhaps an agenda behind what's being picked as a story. Yes. Well, the, the Nigeria one, what that is, the story behind that story, is the recolonization of Africa and following the um, invasion of Libya in 2011, how the US has moved in to Africa to face off its great economic rival, China, but has moved in in a military way. So suddenly these children are the interest of the president's wife and of the State Department and of the US military. And if you read between the lines, you find that this whole looking for these children has become quite a big military exercise in Africa. Of course, the theft of these children is a shocking business. Uh, but those that appear to be concerned about it and are helping, allegedly helping to find the children, have other agendas. And I think, again, here it's other agendas. What are they? Yes. Um, John, uh, welcome to Sheffield. I wonder if you saw the uh, recent BBC Newsnight programme, which exposed and revealed the uh, collusion between British governments uh, and the Brazilian dictatorship between 1964 and 1985, mm. whereby uh, British, uh, consecutive British government sent British military operatives over to Brazil to ably assist them in disappearing, killing and yeah. uh, torturing people. Um, could you uh, sort of comment on that, linking back to what you just earlier mm. said about how you differentiated between the different space between the so-called mainstream media here in Britain and mm. that in Australia and uh, yeah. the US? Well, it, I, I know of that. No, I haven't seen it. And it's a very, very important story. And it has to be said that uh, just when you think the BBC, which is probably the most important media organization in this country and one of the most important in the world, just when you think it's taking everything at face value, it, it demonstrates that it's not monolithic and it produces an excellent program like that. Um, but really that the collusion of the British state with um, the overthrow of governments, and that was the overthrow of the Guia government in Brazil in 1964, a democracy. Interesting is we're now looking at the World Cup, how many people, I wonder, understand the amazing history of Brazil, that Brazil actually was one of the pioneers of democratic ideas. A lot of its people helped to frame the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and that uh, Guyard's government was a democratic government brutally overthrown in 1964 by the generals with, uh, uh, with their ventriloquists, the United States and Britain. Britain has been involved in all of these, almost all of them. If not directly involved, then cheering from the sidelines. Um, and that remains one of the great untold, almost epic stories of our time. The way Britain, the British state, has involved itself in the affairs of other governments to the detriment of, those, of the people in those countries. The gentleman at the back, I think, has a mic. Oh, who has a mic? Yep. Hi, hi John. Hi, John. Um, you've always struck, struck me as being a, a journalist that's asked um, often very difficult, very probing, and sometimes very uncomfortable questions. Um, not more so personally for me, the, the film that you made on the late Nelson Mandela. Um, I just wonder what your thoughts were uh, since his passing and on the rise of the new um, uh, radical uh, uh, black parties that have, been, uh, that, have, that have sprung up since. Yeah, I don't think the rise of the, the black party in is terribly is such a positive development. I think those, many of those supporting it are supported because they are frustrated that 
apartheid for them did not die. The most powerful form of apartheid was never racial apartheid, the words up, no blacks. It was economic apartheid. And that has continued. Been many, many very good changes in South Africa. But that basic system uh, has produced um, uh, the, an, another form of the apartheid. You know, um, Mel Nelson Mandela was a great man, but he wasn't a great politician. And uh, he, uh, he, he inspired so many people that he's almost in a special category. But he was devoted to this African National Congress and wouldn't hear a word said against them. I know because when I interviewed him and asked him um, to say a word, he, uh, I got um, the uh, Mandela equivalent of smack wrists. Uh, um, but he, he said some extraordinary things in that interview that indicated to me that although he'd had a vision of freedom for his people, he had no real political vision. Um, but too much rested on one man anyway. Um, we had someone at the back, yeah. And I know I'm, I'm getting signal to finish, but we, uh, he's saying the head of program did give us a dispensation to finish till 10 to 4, so, yep. And then, Hi. there. Hi, um, I read an article recently, um, I think you wrote in the New Statesman, where you were quite sympathetic. Where, sorry, where are you? Sorry, You're at the back. Right, um, there you are. On your okay. left. Right, okay. Just, nope, just over here. Oh, there you are. Right, okay. <laughs> Hi there. Um, I read an yes. article recently, I think it was in the New Statesman, where you were quite sympathetic towards uh, the Russians in the uh, current Ukraine crisis. I wondered if you could just uh, elaborate on that mm. uh, and um, tell us whether your, mm. your opinion has developed whilst the, um, the crisis has, uh, has continued. Mm. Thanks. Well, I don't think I wrote that I was sympathetic towards the Russians. Sorry. No. <laughs> uh, that's like I'm synth sympathetic towards Russian people and... Uh, most certainly. Um, what I pointed out was, and I think the Ukraine is an absolutely vivid example of the kind of disinformation that we get as news all the time. Uh, the the uh, elected regime government in uh, Kiev was overthrown uh, in, by a group effectively led by neo-Nazis. Uh, it wasn't a very good government, but they'd elected it. Uh, it was overthrown and was backing those neo-Nazis was Washington. There's plenty of evidence for that. Uh, the Ukraine has played uh, a very, very important role as a buffer state since the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, the ambition of the United States since the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall has been to surround the Soviet e Union, even though it promised Gorbachev that NATO, uh, and the words were, will not expand one inch to the east. I don't think we need a history lesson here to understand what the Russians think about all those invasions that have come in from Western Europe. Uh, and I think what has upset uh, this uh, scenario is that the Russians have not been provoked. Yes, they did annex Crimea, uh, a part of Russia that they had uh, a, a legal agreement to base their fleet there, uh, a special situation around Sevastopol, the Crimea had, itself had been handed over by Khrushchev, who was himself a Ukrainian, uh, quite illegally in 1954. Uh, so they certainly took Ukraine, although they took it with the, uh, the, uh, uh, with the agreement of something like 90% of the people. The 
the idea that we should now uh, fall into a kind of Cold War rhetoric of everything anti-Russian and anti-China, that's coming too. That there is these, the kind of thing I grew up with, that there's only one side and you're on that side. There aren't two sides. Um, the fact that Ru the Russians have not been provoked they have not invaded Ukraine. The wrongly called um, pro-Russians, they're ethnic Russians. They're Ukrainians, actually. And for quite a long time, they've been trying to get a federation that reflects the ethnic makeup of Ukraine. And also, that gives them an autonomy, but also secures an independence from Russia. They themselves understand that they're right next to this vast and very powerful country, Russia. Now, all of that has been thrown up for grabs by the intervention of NATO, which will have um, uh, next month, I think, there'll be British troops actually exercising near the Russian border in Ukraine as part of NATO unbelievably provocative against, uh, up against uh, the Russian Federation. I always try to turn it around to imagine if that was happening on the Mexican border or on the Canadian border. It's very, very dangerous. It is probably the most dangerous flashpoint in the world because Russia is a powerful nuclear armed country. So um, I think I perhaps pointed that out in the article you read. Yep, just here at the front. Sorry? Just over at the front. Ah, OK. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you for choosing Sheffield to come up to and speak to us today. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I wanted to ask you about your opinion for Muslims wanting a return for the Islamic Caliphate in the Muslim world. How big is it, in your view? And what would you say about its legitimacy? Just repeat the first part. I missed the first part of your question, please. I wanted to ask about the call for the return of oh. the Islamic Khilafa or Caliphate in the Muslim world, yeah. the Islamic State. In your view, how big is it? And what would you say about its legitimacy? I don't know how big it is. Um, I understand the the call for it, but I, I also understand the cause that um, Muslims are the most numerous victims of the war on terror right throughout the world. Uh, that has had a very profound effect on M Muslim groups in many countries, including this country. Uh, people have felt that a line has been drawn, not simply an ideological line, but a line of religion and faith, a cultural line down the world. Uh, the battle of civilizations, I think, as Samuel Huntington called it, and he was one of the early ones that drew this line. So I think all those those, that turmoil, if you like, in Muslim countries, the, the rise of, I would call it, an Islamic nationalism, a very intense Islamic nationalism in many parts of the world, including this country, is a reaction to that. Uh, I believe in this country, um, with, as Muslim people are a minority, then it is the moral duty of the state and the majority to ensure that people who are a minority feel secure. Uh, and I think that which is seen as extremism can often then recede 
the moment people feel secure. This is a very broad brush answer to your question, but it's about the best I can give at this stage. I think Muslims in Britain and in other Western countries, and in other countries of course, have been under siege. And when people are under siege, all kinds of things happen. And we, for me, one of the most embarrassing things to happen politically in this country for a while, domestically, um, is the Theresa May and our, our, our very own neocon, uh, Michael Gove, and the Ofsted reports. Yeah, the it's Trojan a, horse yeah. uh, nonsense. Well, you only have to read Michael Gove's book, so-called, that he wrote in 2006. <laughs> You called, read it? <laughs> called in, well, no, he read it. Basically, he's a Murdoch. He's a Murdoch. The, well, I don't like using the word hack a lot, but I think it's made for Michael Gove. He was a Murdoch <laughs> hack who worked for the Times uh, and uh, brought his rather extreme views. And, you know, we talked earlier about propaganda. Our extremism is never identified as extremism, but it's extremism. What could, how could it not be extremism when you go and invade a country and as a direct result of that, perhaps a million people are killed and their country and society are, d are devastated? That's extremism. Michael Gove represents that strand of extremism within Western society. His book, called The Trojan Horse, is, uh, is how... Uh, 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 all good non-Muslim Britons should hide under their beds because there was this enemy within, basically. I'm paraphrasing, but I'm sure I'm doing it justice. This man is now the education secretary. And if there are, if there are elements within certain schools, then it's up for the communities and the schools to work that out for themselves. It's not up to a propagandist like Gove to declare a whole series of schools suddenly go from being congratulated in the Ofsted report to regard it as inadequate. It's for the communities. Not quite. Do we have anyone upstairs, actually? Then, yeah, this gentleman there, um, if you shout it out, I'll repeat the question. Can you shout, please? There's a saying in Africa that flies change and ship. Flies change, but the ship remains the same. Uh, we now know that 80 individuals have as much wealth as the poorest 3 billion in the, in the world. We have a cabinet that is stocked with uh, people from one school. My question, you've got five minutes, what do we do about that? <laughs> what, what are you doing about it? <laughs> No, I'm asking you. You know, you know, you can't. You know, it's not not some not some sort of let's find a leader. You, you know, what are you doing about it? What, what do I do? I, I'm trying to open younger minds and get them to watch your. Good, stuff. excellent, <laughs> well done. That's called direct action. Yes, gentleman there. <laughs> yeah. It's a microphone. Part of the, you've spoken about the fact that the media is part of the control system, and you've talked about the fact that it's propaganda, and it does seem like we're presented with this very specific narrative that's very universal. My question to you is, who's driving that? Who is in control, and who is driving that narrative? And do we have a free press in Britain? Very few are in control. The thing has a, has become, it has a momentum of its own. I don't, there's no conspiracy here. People aren't sitting around saying, let's control the mines, although there are production meetings in which they um, have certain agendas for the news. Uh, but I'm not, I don't think we're referring to that. Um, it, it's, we have a, a system that divides people the gentleman there rightly spoke about the, the, uh, the, the transfer, massive transfer of wealth from the majority to a small minority. Now, that used to be called capitalism, and it still is. It's a form of extremism. It makes no sense. It denies people uh, a basic, decent way of living. It, it, uh, 
it, it, it lies. It says there is a debt to be paid back by the people when it's not the people's debt. It's their debt. Um, so these divisions, these divisions are reflected in that system and an expression of that system is the media. I mean, the me we've, we've always had this romantic view, I think, of the media being like a, a fourth estate, you know, uh, Edmund Burke's idea that it would check all the other um, <clears throat> pillars of uh, a democratic society. That's nonsense. That's a romantic view. The media has always been, <clears throat> when I started in it, now an extension of the state, an extension of the, the received wisdom of the state. And the received wisdom of this state is, as Margaret Thatcher said, there is only one way. And that's what needs to be challenged. The media reflects that, uh, that, that almost that, that monologue about one way. Uh, so it doesn't come down to a group of people in a darkened space uh, working all this out. It is structural. It is the nature of the beast. And the first thing we have to do, the very first thing, is to understand that. We have to, under we have to enlighten ourselves. We have to learn not to take at face value the kind of things that we're we're told um, in, in public media, uh, that we have to learn, and perhaps it's an answer to your question, to take a kind of both an intellectual and a political direct action. We have to understand first of all and then do something about it. The most powerful force in our society is this insidious propaganda. There's no question about that. Once we understand that, perhaps then we can do something about it. I'm aware that we're getting close to a time where people are going to have to walk down to see the film Utopia. Um, I'm just going to round off with one final question regarding two of the clips that we've seen. Um, first of all, in uh, Palestine is Still the Issue mm. from 2002, we have an ex-soldier who says that in Israel now, if you speak out against Israel, you're regarded as anti-Semitic, mm. which mirrors comments that were made earlier this year by Benjamin Netanyahu. Yeah. You have an earlier film from 1988, The Last Dream, Other People's Wars, and you actually quote, or you reuse um, part of your script 25 years later in Utopia, or paraphrase what um, you said in 1988. Yes, I think, I know what you're saying. What, in I'm fact, curious about in the Palestine, what goes around, comes around. Well, in the two Palestine films, the first Palestine film I made was 1976. It was called Palestine is Still the Issue. The next one was 2002, called Palestine is Still the Issue. The point was that it was still the issue. Nothing had changed. In, you, in my early films from Australia, and that clip that you refer to, um, where I said that um, at the end of the film that um, Australians can't really regard themselves as an independent society until, or as a nation, until they give back nationhood to those whose country it was and is. And I say virtually the same words at the end of Utopia. So that's 1988, and here we are, 2014. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a long, all these, change doesn't happen overnight, and those who perhaps fall away don't really understand that. Cha the, 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 of always, I feel as a journalist, that I have to go back and gather information that may have fallen behind that may have been forgotten, a new gen generation will come up, that memory will be, um, won't be as the same as when I made that film. So it means a certain repetition almost. It's bringing up to date, because some truths and principles, of course, never change. 
You can go to johnpilger.com and see all of John's films online. It is an incredible body of work. You can also read so many of his articles that he's written over the years and order his excellent books. Um, if you can't see Utopia this afternoon, it is available um, to buy on DVD. As I said at the start, I think it's one of the most remarkable films of John's career. Thank you very much to DocFest for organizing this event, but most of all, can you please join me in thanking John Pilgrim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.